This is how you do it. If you want to find anything decent, you have to go dig it. And um, this is Rob Avis, Andy's youngest son and lookalike. And um, I mean, really and truly, that answers my question, doesn't it? Why go caving overseas? Why wouldn't you? Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? When actually, you can buy an airline ticket and you go to somewhere like Sarawak and you can walk into something like this. And so two years ago, no CCCs in the UK until Robbie Schoen and Tom Chapman and myself went to Wookie Hole after Hidden Earth and we were going to visit the newly opened Wookie 20 and walking along and Tom says to us, watch out for the white stuff on the floor. We don't know what it is, but we think it might be old back guano. And we looked down and this is what we saw and I kind of went, oh yeah, okay, and just kept on walking. And Robbie went, no, wait, Gina, look, it's CCCs, which any of you who knows Robbie is not very scientific, and I just ignored it, so it, it was quite wonderful, really. Caves are dark. When we take a photograph, it takes a lot of time to get the, the light in there. So we've got Nikki Bailey. What in it is dark, illumined. We've got Russ Brooks in his happy realms of light. We've got Mark Berkey, who, in a sudden view, appear the secrets of the hoary deep. John Cordingly, who can make a heaven out of hell with his photography. These tower cones are, are quite unique. Um, they're formed underwater, so these stalagmites are formed underwater. And this is one of the best examples in the world of these tower cones. And they're only formed in these giant gower pools that you can see here, these giant gowers that are here. This passage here is about 85 metres wide, and there's about a thousand of these littered throughout the cave. They asked how much cave was actually within the SSSIs, and that made us realise we didn't actually know how many caves there were in Britain. Uh, in those pre-internet days, the only way to find out uh, was that I, uh, I had Paul Hardwick as a, an assistant, and he basically, we went out and we bought a copy of every guidebook that there was. And uh, if there are any um, young earth creationists in the audience, well, I mean, one of the things that one can uh, do is to say, take, take a bottle. There's a bottle that's been sectioned. Put that bottle in a cave. Uh, this, this one's in, in, in France. And just leave it there for 20 years. Take the bottle out, slice it. And there we've got, you know, we've got 20 years of growth. We can see these layers and we can prove that they are annual layers. And you then say, right, then, now look at your stalagmite that's this high, and look at the layers, they're the same, they're the same layers, and count them. So it's a, a, a tremendously simple way of, of demonstrating the, the nature of the passage of time. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the re-excavation of some of the old, well-known cave sites. Um, John Gunn mentioned some of those at Creswell Crags in uh, Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, um, and says some of the reasons why we are revisiting those sites and recovering uh, more information. New one. Around about 1900, there were uh, three open caves on the Mendip Hills. Caving wasn't really big. Um, since then, we've uh, been looking around and uh, this is a current state of play, at least I believe the current state of play. I know you can't make any sense out of it. Um, there's something like 1,800 sites there. And this powerful draft blasted sand into their faces as they dug. Wouldn't it be great to find those sorts of places now? And they dug into what we now call OF OFD1. Uh, as the discoverers were returning back down the streamway, um, it was obvious that the news had spread quickly, and local families were wading up the stream to, to find out what had been discovered. Alan, who had a, my brother over there, <laughs> who had an electric lamp, he was pushed into this thing to see if it went. And off he went, and then he'd gone. No sign of him. So basically, I pinched another electric lamp from somebody else and followed him. And I found him sitting on the edge of this trench with his feet dangling in the water. Most CO2 comes from the soil, mixes with the water to produce carbonic acid, and that ends up dissolving the limestone or dolomite within the host rock. Um, and that's where you get most of your dissolution occurring at a, at a soil bedrock interface. But of course, some of that 
uh, acidity goes into the fractures, into the joints within the rock, and uh, dissolves out the limestone. So, but if you're trying to work out how the landscape has changed, choose your passage carefully. Horizontal passages are best because a slight change in, in base level, or the, the level at which the water is actually ultimately emerging from the limestone, can have a very considerable effect on passages like this. It will mean that the water is going to kind of either cut down to the floor or it's going to find another low, low road. So you can have the whole succession of l sort of lower passages. Whereas this sort of thing, it's great, you know, deep, spectacular, scares me shitless, but... Um, if you drop base level by 50 or 100 meters, all it does is the shaft gets deeper. But increasingly, it's becoming appreciated that particularly cave air carbon dioxide, and this is something that I'll, I'll spend most of the, um, the, the talk focusing on, is carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is a major control on stalagmite growth rates, which of course feeds into us understanding stalagmite climate records um, better. And as I'm sure as you're, you're all aware, and I'm, I'm sure you heard from Ian and others this weekend, stalagmites are rapidly becoming very important archives of, of past climate. This is the original survey. <clears throat> and just to give you some kind of feeling of scale, <clears throat> here we are. You can see us at uh, the Royal Geographical Society. Just adjacent to us on the left there, we've got the Royal Albert Hall. This is Deer Cave to the same scale. And this is Sarawak Chamber. The way in. So uh, when climbing up the Avon, uh, some side passages were noted, one at 130 metres. They excavated that. Uh, that caused a slumping in a shake her way above. So October 1999, permission was gained and a surface dig started. Pretty competent. They can bolt. They can rig. They're beginning to survey pretty well, and it won't be long before Chinese will be doing foreign expeditions. Now, if you remember my very first slide, China has, I think it was 1.3 billion people. So if you take a tiny little fraction of that that are cavers, there's going to be tens of millions of cavers coming our way. Uh, more recently, uh, we've, uh, British divers have got uh, involved in uh, projects in this area, uh, this time in the Watler Resurgence, so where the water comes back out of the mountain, and we were there in 2016 and 2017. Remember, Rick and Jason were there in, in fact, 2001, so this is all part of that continuing story. A question I was once asked, what, what are the particular problems of caving in Africa? Well, um, you've got chaps like this floating around in caves. Now, to be honest, hyenas have very big teeth, very strong jaws, and I don't like them. But fair's fair, the only time I've actually met a hyena in a cave, family of four, they backed off quicker than I did. She tells me with authority, being an arts student, um, that it's now 270 kilometres long, which is pretty impressive. That's all underwater. That's all surveyed by cave divers, not me. 1,635 cave sites known. 1,003 of them have been explored. 648 kilometres of survey passage, and Megalair seems to keep on giving, which is great. The Yorkshire Ramblers came over, and they weren't long to, uh, to, in getting into noons, extraordinary in their uh, jackets and putties and things going down this. And it must have gone a little bit like this. This is a recreation done uh, around 1982, something like that. Enniskillen has boats on Loch Ern and is not without ship's chandlers. So a ladder of some 105 feet was constructed with rungs cut and bored at a local timber merchant's. Meanwhile, down south, I'd set my sights on Wookiee Hole and in 1977 and 1982 achieved what was then British cave diving depth records and using, as you see on my, on my left arm there, the first underwater diving computer ever used in the British Isles. So it was really useful. And here I am making surface decompression, breathing pure oxygen on the surface so as to strip out residual nitrogen uh, from the body. We, we would do solo, successive solo dives, I'm going to call it, where one person would do a dive, relay the information to the next person who would maybe dive the day or two days after and therefore continue like that. All this is about exploration, but there are other 
ways that our diving has been utilised, and this is, a, I, did, I was hesitant about including this, um, and that is to help or help resolve it, instant, it, it, uh, incidents abroad. So I was called by the French authorities saying we've got a diver missing, we haven't got any cave divers capable of going there, we really abs absolutely need you guys over here. I'll tell you a little story about this. As you can imagine, long going around the, uh, the caves is quite hard work. And in Maus chamber, the largest chamber in the world by volume, uh, Andy put the scanner down because he needed to find the way on and he was getting a bit tired lugging it all around. Anyway, two and a half hours later, we found it again. <laughs> oh, it was. <laughs> okay, so here we are. Here's our scan. And as you can see, if we zoom in, we can see an awful lot of detail on all your wonderful faces um, in the scan. Yeah, you know, there's, I don't know who that is. I don't, who's, that, who's that falling asleep? Here's a numerical model for a, for a homogeneous me medium above a void tunnel in this particular case. And essentially the load in the, uh, above the chamber is borne by the stress being diverted along a compression or voussoir arch, uh, which diverts the load through to the margins through here. And this is the conventional principle we use in building bridges, of course. So this is what happens in the book. They've just got through this very long, deep and dangerous sump, and um, they've set up an underground camp, planning to push for several days in this extraordinary system. And so Bill, as you would, offered Barbara a back rub. Sure, she said, rolling over in her sleeping bag. <laughs> you can read it. <laughs> I, sh I should have given a warning that... I hope There's no children here, are there? No. We might be able to set some sort of depth record right here. <laughs> well, perhaps they do hold that record. For the real advances, we're going to shift over to Bunsen of Bunsen Burner um, and a colleague, Henry Roscoe. And Roscoe was Manchester man. The pair of them prepared the first isolation of magnesium. And magnesium, when it first appeared, that was this wonder stuff. People would hold soirees. They'd black out a room so that they could burn the stuff and make it as light as day. Which they... Right, this map shows the surveyed centre lines of the major caves around Matienzo. The Four Valley system is here with 60 kilometres. There's 34 kilometres in the South Ega system. 34 kilometres in the Cueva Vaine system, and of course those two should eventually be linked together. There's 24 kilometres in Torquilabaca and 22 kilometres in the North Vega system. England in 1978, and the thing is, this is the last time the RGS coughed up money for exploring England. I think the rest of it's been fairly well explored. I know that's how it works. So I, we now have what's called the three counties system, whereby all these caves have been joined together as well. And you can now go from Yorkshire to Cumbria for the Lake District, underneath Lancashire, which goes down really well with Yorkshiremen who want a weekend in Lancashire, in, in, the, in Cumbria, in the Lake District. Got that one wrong, didn't I? Cavers make maps. It's an intrinsic part of caving, and somebody who spoke towards the end of this two-day epic, or two-and-a-half-day epic of lectures that Andy told you about at the very beginning, said in, in, on a video of original exploration uh, in, in Spain, I think, how are you getting on? Because if you don't, it doesn't exist if it's not on the survey. In other words, they were, in that case, surveying uh, compass and tape and clinometer and so on as they went along into this never before seen cave passage. So this is Lechigia Cave, it's over 200 kilometers long. It is one of the deepest caves in the United States, it's over 500 meters deep and it was all built by microbial activity. So the microorganisms would burn the hydrogen sulfide to make sulfuric acid, that sulfuric acid would react with the calcium carbonate to generate gypsum. And there's lots of evidence of this microbial activity. This is the gypsum that's left behind from the microbial activity um, uh, within the cave. There's huge piles of it that we, we have to climb over. Um, it was a wonderful evening, combining science, passion, adventure, and the applications that bring geography together. So please join me in thanking our speakers this evening. <laughs> <laughs>